everyone. Um, our first viticulture session is by Zoom due to what happened last week with COVID. And also, I think the weather events have probably made it a bit easier for everyone to be involved with it like this. So welcome, everyone, and thank you for your time. Um, today's session, our speakers are Albany-based entomologists Svetlana Mikic to talk on snails, Richard Fennessy, research scientist, grape and wine at Deepherd, New Farm Agronomist and Horticultural Manager Bernie Zara and Research Scientist Scott Payton and our experienced local agronomist Brooke Anderson. So um, I'll start the session and if I could ask Svetlana, we'll just start on snails and um, she had a really good slideshow to show us about the different types of snails. So Svetlana, if you could just start talk us through the snails that are found in Western Australia and also their life cycle. Sure thing. Um, one of the main reasons for going through what species we've got is because we do have a few snails that are of biosecurity concern and we really rely on agriculture, people in agricultural industries to identify them. So we've got mainly five snails in our state. So we've got the vineyard snail and the white Italian, which are predominantly an issue in vineyards around Franklin, um, Mount Barker, Plantagenet, but I've been told that not so much an issue around um, your area. It's more the garden snail, which is an issue around your area. But one of the other snail species that we're getting more and more reports about, especially in Plantagenet, is a small pointed snail. This is very similar to the large pointed snail, which occurs from Geraldton all the way along the coast down towards Augusta. This particular snail species is one that's predominant in South Australia. So what you tend to find is if you do a web search for biological control, you'll find there's all these web pages in South Australia about a particular fly. It's very, very effective on the pointed snail, which isn't really a pest in our part of the world. One of the other reasons for wanting you to all be able to identify the snail species is that um, in my part of the world, Albany, we've just been included in the green snail area, which basically means that anyone in horticulture now needs to sign off on that they are green snail free, especially if they're exporting to Tasmania or anywhere else. Um, so please, if you see an unusual snail, please get it identified. Um, because it can affect our export markets. Now, um, now just so you can see what the different species are, you can see the garden snail is quite big, it's brown. The white Italian snail and the vineyard snail, look, they look very much the same. They're pretty much white and round. The big difference between them is that the white Italian snail, when you flip it upside down, it's got a, it's got, it doesn't really have a very clear hole. The um, vineyard snail does have a clear hole. And if you actually go back and look at the picture here, you'll see that the vineyard snail has got a continuous brown line and the white Italian snail doesn't. That line, some snails are completely white, so you can't tell. So they're really the only way to tell is by that hole in the back. Reason that's important is if you see something that is different to these snails, please let us know, because we do rely on you very much to be able to um, identify them. The other big issue that we've got between these snail species is the three snails on the right, white Italian, small pointed vineyard snail, are very difficult to kill, do not get attracted to baits. Garden snail is a bit easier. It's got olfactory sensors, basically means it can smell baits so you can control it. All of our pest snails are introduced. The way they got into uh, Broadacre is 110 down the highway. The rate way it got onto properties in the horticultural industry is pretty much people bringing them on. Um, very rarely have they actually arrived through a fence line. Now, Mike, I think you might have some more questions about control and things like that. Yep. Well, we've got the diff um, So the main snails in Margaret River are the small pointed snail and the garden snail. So probably if we could talk a little bit about the life cycle of both of those snails. And then we can then look at how we can control them from there. The good news is um, the, what I've dealt with with the garden snail is mainly people growing them up for the food industry. 
Um, there is a dearth of suppliers for uh, snails for the food industry. I don't recommend going into it because it's a pain in the butt of a job. But the good news is that all of our snails have pretty much a similar life cycle. Summer, they estivate and really become active from um, February onwards. The biggest issue that you've got is that you need to control the snails before they lay eggs. Um, pretty much small pointed and garden snail, after you see them mating, they'll lay their eggs within seven to 14 days. Both snails of a mating pair will lay eggs. There is some evidence to show that um, the garden snail can self-fertilize, but that's in extreme rare cases. You, they, they usually they just need to mate and definitely with a small pointed snail they do need to mate the eggs have to stay moist so what we found is in the small pointed snail they do not lay eggs in summer at all the garden snail is unlikely to have any eggs survive unless you have a very very wet summer um, and that's not usually the case and even under irrigation there's been no evidence to show that they do lay eggs over summer and that they survive. Um, right now, Richard's noticed snails in his front yard are mating. That's the garden snail is actively mating. So we can expect that around the Bunbury area that snails will be laying eggs soon. What does that mean? Too. Sorry? It'd be the same here too, Svetlana, so. Yes, <laughs> and what that base, yeah, what that means is if you haven't done anything to control them in the next few weeks, they will lay eggs, those eggs will hatch and you'll have a problem for next year. The problem is that the only control measure that works effectively is baiting. And the problem with baits is that you need to bait at a rate where the baits aren't competing with any green plant material and that the snails will come across them and feed on them. The problem that we've got in for the small pointed snail is they're not attracted to baits. They may feed on green plant material. They may feed on um, dead organic matter. They will only feed on a bait if they encounter it. And if there's green between the rows, you'll probably find that the baits won't work. Garden snail are a little bit easier. They will get attracted to those baits. But again, if there's anything green, um, the baits won't work as well. Uh, so what I have up on the screen is actually the control for garden snail in citrus. Mm -hmm. And I just thought we'd just bring up, because everyone keeps asking me about copper sprays. For the small pointed snail, we found it wasn't very effective. Um, research that's been done by Deep Herd found that copper, spray, copper sprays are quite effective in deterring the garden snail. That's because they got more surface area, the two different snails. So the copper affects them that way. That's more, yeah, because they do absorb the copper through the foot and it's a deterrent. Um, yes. And also the garden snail has more of a climbing habit. Um, so if you plant, a, you know, if you plant a tree, if you spray a tree with copper, the mm. garden snail is more likely to come into contact with it. Whereas what we found with a small pointed snail is sometimes they'll climb a tree, sometimes they won't and sometimes they'll be just on the ground and they don't actually get deterred by that copper. Yeah, so damage of small pointed snails, are they gonna eat a lot of green material or not really be too much of an issue? Uh, like, so is that something you need to focus on controlling or it's not too much of an issue? Well, for all of our pest snails, no matter what time of year it is, if there's enough rain, and there's, that will initiate movement. Yep. And if there's anything green, they'll feed on it. Okay. So right. there is the potential for feeding damage though. Most people I've spoken to, the small pointed snail has not really been an issue in established vineyards. It's been mainly on the seedlings, but the garden snail depends on what sort of year you're having and as to how much leaf material there is as to whether or not there's been a big problem. Okay. And then monitoring for snails, just basically go out and have a look. You got plenty, you got plenty. There's, or do you need to do a quadrant or anything? What would be the better way to monitor for them? 
This is a really difficult one. And the reason for it is it really depends on your species. So if you've got the garden snail, it's actually quite easy. You can see them up the stems of the vineyard, up the stems of the vines or up a fence post. And so you can visually see that you've got snails and you can go, right, well, I actually need to do something. Mm -hmm. With a small pointed snail, unless you're having an issue with during harvest, which has occurred in Plantagenet, where we've had, they've been a grain, a, a harvest contaminant. Um, they can be quite difficult to detect because they are very cryptic over summer and they actually hide under leaf litter and are under the ground up to five centimetres. That's been one of the problems with this particular snail species. To determine whether or not you're doing a good job, seeing dead snails is a nice big tick but the number of live snails you've got is critical because for the small pointed, what we've had people do is bait, kill a lot, think they've done a good job and not do a follow-up look to make sure how many live snails there are. And those live snails that are left can actually cause a problem for next year. So for small pointed snails, you may need more than one baiting event or more than one measure of control to control them. For the garden snail, you can get away with a single bait event, but if they've already laid eggs, you'll have a problem next year. Yep, okay, good, cool. Um, habitats, what can you do to reduce the burden? Like what can you do in the vineyard? Say you've got a really high number of garden snails. Is it worth doing to cultivate to help clean up the situation? The less plant material you have between the interrows makes it much easier for the snails to get attracted to baits so you can kill them. Mm -hmm. um, cultivation of interrows after eggs have been laid will cause some mortality to the eggs if they're present in this place in where you're cultivating. However, with small pointed snail, um, oh, this one is a pain in the butt because um, a single cultivation probably won't do much for, to kill them off. Yeah. Um, because we've actually found them surviving in all sorts of spots in a broad acre situation. So even a speed tiller hasn't killed them. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they will be under where the vines are. So you can actually have a population under the vines, which is enough to cause damage if you're trying to do a replanting. Yeah, okay. All right. Mm, makes it fun. Okay. Um, and Mike, just, just on that point with the small pointed snails, I guess following on from our last seminar when we we're talking about cover crops, if we're going to be spending the money on the seed and prep of the ground, fertilizers, etc., we also want to protect those and those small pointed snails can do a lot of damage to some of the, the cover crop seedlings. Um, on that brook, are many people liming in paddocks? Um, yes, and I was going to follow up on that too. If we're liming and getting our pHs up there. We're only giving them a food source and we can just see populations exploding, uh, de depending on the season, as obviously. But, yeah, we have seen extreme damage and it is only enhanced if we're, if we're liming. And one of the reasons you're seeing that is the snails will feed on, on the actual lime that's on the soil surface. So even if you incorporate the lime, there's still enough on the soil surface for the snails to feed on. And what that actually does is increases the shell strength of the snails, but also increases fecundity. So the number of eggs they lay. Um, so, and we don't wanna stop people from liming. It's just something to bear in mind that if you have especially small pointed snails and you do lime, you can have you actually assist the population. And even though you've baited and got your numbers down, the following year you might have actually more snails because what's actually happened is that limes just help them have nice strong shells. The babies have nice strong shells so they can survive a hot summer and you just have a bit of an issue the following year. Just have a question. Um, if snow, garden snails are laying eggs now and the temperature gets back up to 20s to 30s, mm -hmm. is that going to help on the mortality of the eggs? And yeah, So probably not too much of an issue to worry about this arraign event and the snails and, laying eggs? Uh, it will all, yeah, look, it depends. Because if the weather conditions continue and it's mild and we don't get those hot events, what you'll actually find is that there is the possibility for the eggs to hatch. Yeah. Um, if you do get a hot event, you'll actually find that um, 
especially in those interrows, you can actually find that there's quite a lot of dead snails. Um, and everyone gets really excited about seeing lots of dead snails because a hot summer causes mortality in, in the small snails that were born, say, from September, October. But it's the numbers that are still living. So don't be all happy that uh, you're seeing lots of dead ones. Please look for the live ones and um, they'll be actively moving after a rain event. So would it be worth doing a bait now or probably wait for the true autumn break? What we've done in Broadacre is we've recommended that if the paddocks are completely browned out, and unfortunately vineyards are never like that, um, if it's completely browned out, do a patch bait, see if the snails are actively feeding and actively moving before you bait an entire area. And this is the same here. Have a look at your situation. If there is a lot of green plant material between the vines, it's a waste of time baiting. If the plant material isn't as green or as vibrant and it looks like it's hanging off and drying off, consider doing a patch bait, especially where you can see the snails, see if they're actively feeding. And if you're seeing dead snails surrounding a bait, and this is especially true for garden snails, you can get away with a bait right now. Um, but I would recommend not baiting an entire area until you test to make sure that they're actively feeding because we've had a lot of people waste a lot of money trying to control snails by baiting at the wrong time. Okay, good, beautiful. Thank you. Um, all right. Any more questions out there? No. No questions? Oh. Okay. Scott, if I can just ask you on the use of pellets and the importance of calibration and also effects of weather on pellets? That's actually been a big one because um, a lot of growers want to know what is the best pellet, pellet because pellets these days come in a range of sizes and also in a range of concentrations. So what we actually found with small pointer snail is if it's on the label, it will work. Um, if the bait is rain fast or non rain fast, if the snails are actively feeding, they will eat the bait within what they're gonna eat in seven days. So it doesn't matter if you do another bait event, the small pointed snails, that's all they're going to eat. For the garden snail, they're very hungry. So they will actively eat those baits. Um, so the longer the bait lasts in the system, um, so especially if you've got um, a bit of germination or something happening and you're killing off those weeds, if the bait's still there, the garden snail might still encounter it and eat it. So you're better off some, in some situations to do a rain fast bait, but there is a difference in cost. Um, the difference also in the concentration in the baits is such that if it's got a higher concentration, yes, it's true, the snails need to eat less to kill them. But again, it's something that you need to bear in mind um, is the cost and the rate. Now, the baits come in a range of rates. What we recommend is if the numbers are high, and by high, I mean you walk along and you are actively seeing numbers of, say, 10 small pointed snails in a 10 centimetre square. And you're seeing this quite regularly because don't forget, snails are really patchy in their distribution because in one spot you can find hundreds and somewhere else you won't find any. <laughs> Um, and so what can happen there is that um, you can get a, mis a different idea of how many snails there are in your vineyard. And you might think that you've got lots and lots, so you'll bait um, everywhere at that high rate. What we recommend is where you've got lots of snails, bait at the higher rate. We don't have so many snails bait at the lower rate. And depending on your snail, it's really important for bait coverage. So small pointed snails, you because they don't smell the bait, but you're relying on them to encounter the bait. So you need to have an even bait spread for small pointed. Garden snails will smell a bait and go actively to it if there's nothing else to eat. Yeah, okay. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. All right. Very good. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, I'll just introduce Scott. If you want to just poke up and I'll ask you about... Um, the targeting vines for using the baits and also the effects of weather on baits. 
Yeah, sure, Mike. Can you hear me okay? Yep, gotcha. Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's very comprehensive what um, Lana was talking about there. Excellent. Um, so the use of, of different types, I guess, of, of baits is an interesting one. I think the best idea with, with baits is, uh, as was already been spoken about, that the, um, the timing and, and placement of baits into the area where you're gonna get best contact with the snail population as they're moving around uh, the vines is, is ideal. Um, so, I mean, the, there are a couple of different styles of bait options that are available in the market. Uh, I don't know, you sent through a couple that you're looking at from a, a cow eggs perspective with um, the iron EDTA. Um, the metaldehyde's probably the, the, the more common, uh, things like Metarex and slug out. Um, in each case here, we're talking about um, products that will break down and they're effective. This will break down over the period, say up to 10, maybe even 14 days after use. The, the grain based um, bait systems tend to be a lot quicker to break down with moisture. Um, and then you have your rain fast options. And as already uh, spoken about, there's a, a reasonable discrepancy in the cost associated with those. Um, there's also a difference in the effectiveness of, of those types of baits. So um, as a general rule, we, we always look at the metaldehyde based um, bait systems as being slightly more efficacious than the iron chelate options. Um, a lot of that's just to do with the uptake uh, and, and how we load the, the baits with the active ingredient. Uh, and then you get the, the difference in, again between the metaldehydes based on the type of product. So um, Metarex, which would have been used, I think probably the dominant bait in the market this year as an extruded bait of Metarex is a 100% uh, or fairly close to 100%. Um, Metarex is part of an extruded system, whereas you have a Corby structure around the slug out. So there's there's a need for you with a Metarex type product to consume the, most of the bait to get a decent dose rate into them. Um, whereas something like a slug out, the majority of the active ingredients actually on the external part so they can consume a larger amount of the active ingredient and have a, a greater effect with a smaller digestion or smaller contact with the baits. But the, the primary thing I think, and I've always worked off this is, is the bait positioning. So how many baits you can put per square meter increases your chance of good contact with the bait, with the snail. Um, and yes, obviously there's a difference in the different species, but um, our challenge, I guess, from a viticultural point of view, particularly in, in the Margaret River area where we have a higher prevalence of, of uh, I wouldn't say weedy vineyards, but um, less kept vineyards, let's say, uh, organic vineyards where there's there's a large chunk of, of material that the snails can consume and will preferentially consume for the most part while we're trying to control the population. So getting our, our numbers of baits per square meter right for the, each individual product that you choose is really critical. Timing it around that mating period so you can have the biggest impact is really critical. And then monitoring, I think, is the other thing we don't do well. Um, because of that, the cost associated with these products we're often baiting and then we're waiting to see what happens. And then we come back and, and look and we still have a large population cranking along, which either means we missed our timing for the baiting to start with, or um, that we haven't actually controlled the full extent of the population we could have by, by targeting in maybe a, an application, a second application if needed and under heavy pressure situations. Um, in terms of conditions, UV breakdown on baits is common, temperature is commonly an issue and particularly for the less rain fast options that come into this organic space, uh, be very wary of heavy rainfall events around them. they will start to reduce in efficacy. So your timing being perfect is not a problem, but if you're relying on them uh, on a larger vineyard, then you might need to come and do a reapplication for those types of products if there's rainfall events uh, happening between first application and um, and when you think you need to have uh, efficacious baiting. Okay. Right, so the take home from that would be timing, monitoring, and correct application of baits. And calibration, you know, it's the other thing is you look at the labels for these products and they are quite variable in the way they talk about calibration. So you've actually got to go through and make sure you have the right number of baits per square meter, get that, that right for the product that you're using, the types of products. 
Um, and I think that creates the, a lot more variation than we consider. And different types of spruder have an impact on that as well, don't they? Absolutely, so, yeah. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, okay. So you just need to take that into account when you calibrate. Yep. And speaking of that, I'll bring in Richard. Richard, could you just tell us about the trial demonstration that you are going to start this year, hopefully? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, so just for the benefit of those in the audience that aren't familiar with Wine Australia's regional program, um, each year, Wine Australia provides the WA wine industry $50,000 to do demonstration and extension activities. Wines of WA administer that program on behalf of the industry here. And uh, I'm involved in, in uh, essentially sort of um, project managing it on behalf of um, Wines WA. So um, we've been asked to put some uh, activities forward for the coming financial year. And one of those activities is to conduct a demonstration on effective snail management techniques. So I thought it'd be worth um, coming into this webinar and, and, and bringing that, um, that planned activity to your attention. Um, you know, we've talked about different bait types, um, talked a little bit about uh, ground cover um, techniques. Um, so what we're hoping to do is get some funding across the line to, to do uh, one or two demonstrations um, uh, inside Margaret River or maybe a vineyard also outside of Margaret River and um, take, I guess, take some, some measurements in the field and see how um, effective these techniques are, just so you're better informed of um, how to manage snails on your vineyards. So um, we're yet to develop a methodology. The, the funding won't get ticked off until the 1st of, well, won't come into action until the 1st of July, but we're pretty keen to get the ball rolling considering the, the nature of the life cycle of the, of the pest. So um, yeah, we'll develop that methodology in the coming weeks. Um, I'll sit down with, with Mike and our, our team at DPIRD here and, and um, formulate that methodology. Um, but in the meantime, just like to offer an expression of interest to vineyards that would like to participate. Uh, if we can get a, a list of a small list of vineyards that are interested, then we can go through once we've developed a methodology and see where that methodology might align with the with the vineyards that have um, have uh, expressed an interest. So. Um, pretty early days, I don't have much else to say other than um, if you are interested, um, feel free to drop drop me a line or, or Mike, and uh, we can continue that discussion. Beautiful. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Thanks very much, Richard. Svetlana, I've got one question. Do we know of a beneficial crop that we could add to our mid undervine mix that we could plant that snails enjoy more or would that attract them? I think it's green, they're going to eat it. Would that be right? Um, yes and no. Um, so snails do prefer broadleaf plants, plants with a softer leaf. The problem that you've got is that if you plant an intercrop, uh, interrow that with a plant that the snails absolutely love, is that you're going to breed the snails there, and then they'll just come out from that breeding ground and go into the crop, into your vineyard, into your vines, because um, as summer can, happens, they will climb. And it's that climbing habit and being on the vines that is an issue. Yep. And also springtime, they like eating all the green shoots. Yeah. And that's unfortunately not going to stop them. Um, and the other question that people get asked is, well, can we plant something that they don't like so it um, makes them move away? <sighs> that's a difficult one too, because um, anything, you are right, anything that's pretty much green um, they will like. You can plant something like a succulent, which they don't like to eat, but it's really good harborage for them. So basically it'll protect them over a hot, dry summer. So bottom line is there's really nothing that I know of. Um, and if someone does hear of something or hears of some research, we'd probably be really um, happy to hear from you because that is one thing that we have been looking for, something you can plant that snails don't like and that will um, push them away. Perfect, perfect. All right, great. Thanks very much for that. Um, I'm going to wrap up the snail part and now I'm going to go to Bernie. So the take home from the snail bit would be monitoring, 
timing of baits and maybe cleaning your environment a little bit before the application of baits. Okay, that'd be great. All right, Mike, thank you very Mike, much. Mike, before you close snails, can I just remind the audience of another thing about biosecurity? So with harvest um, impending, obviously there'll be a lot of uh, movement of harvest bins uh, across vineyards. Um, just be mindful of snails being attached to those bins. Um, I've commonly seen, you know, sides of bins that have been all um, stacked up, you know, beautiful place for snails to, to reside over the hotter months. Um, just be mindful. If you do see them, try and get them off um, before they get introduced into your, into your vineyard. Thanks, Mike. Beautiful. Thanks very much, Richard. Okay. All right, Bernie, we'll start on weeds, eh? I'll send you a list of questions. Um, I'll start with what, what's some really good control mechanisms we can employ for the perennial grasses that we get in our vineyards this time of year. So we've got cooch, kaikuyu, yeah. and probably a few other taller ones. So just a bit of a plan to deal with them now, but also to try and get better control of them into the future. Yeah. So I think really you want to try, if, you, if you've got a problem now, I'm not going to say it's too, it's too late, but ideally you want to be doing something before now. You, you, that needs to be part of your, your, part of your strategy. Um, perennials, the giveaway, there's, there's strong perennial um, summer growing weeds. So they're not easily controlled uh, by any, any one method in, in particular. I mean, I think now if you've got, if we're talking about right now and you've got fruit uh, in your vineyard, I'm not really advocating any herbicide use right now. And it's more about putting together something that you're going to do as soon as, um, as soon as you've got the fruit out of there. So the, those perennial grasses you need, because of the strength of the plant, the way they reproduce, their root systems, the rhizomes, everything you need, a strong um, translocated herbicide. So, you know, you've got to be thinking about things like glyphosate. I mean, it's simple as that, strong, strong rates of glyphosate or grass selective. Um, so as a FOC, uh, which people know as Fusilade, um, to get the, the active's got to be taken up by green material. So you're really waiting for nice green new shoots um, to be there on the plant. You put those her translocated herbicides on, the, the herbicide's taken up, it's taken down into the root, into the rhizome, and that's where you get, uh, that's where you get your control. So I think you want, ideally you want to be starting before now. If you're at this, if you're at this point now, then it's about waiting um, for your first opportunity once um, the fruit's out. I mean, the products are registered and you could go now and if, you, if you're confident uh, about controlling exactly where the herbicide is, is going, you could do something. Um, it's just an opinion from me, I guess. So just options to use for that, say if you've got a non-bearing vineyard and your kike's a bit out of control, would you go with something like um, like a desiccant to, to knock it down a bit to then deal with less volume later into the season when you can use glyphosate? It, it, that could that could be a strategy just just to reduce I guess reduce the biomass um, that you've got there. But those the desiccants won't control uh, those um, perennial grasses that have got very strong deep root system. You really need that translocated uh, yeah. herbicide. I mean, if you if you've got a non-bearing vineyard, you could do something now with that with those translocated herbicides like you know glyphosate. Um, you would just need to make sure you're not getting it you know on any green parts of the vine. Don't get it on the vine at all. Target it at your weeds, and, and maybe maybe the strategy would be that you'd pick the worst areas and concentrate hard on those um, yeah. to help help reduce the problem. So your taller weeds like flea bane and fat hen and your other stuff. Again, that's another one that you need to control early. Yeah. What are some of the strategies, and when would you be looking at controlling it? So if if we start from this point now, and you've got things like flea bane and, and fat hen, um, you really want to stop seed set. That's got to be your number one, uh, your number one goal. So straight after vintage, you'd be in with your desiccant. 
that's that's where the desk fits in the in the system or, or in your strategy because that works quickly and will stop the plant because we know where we are in in terms of the season you know they're flowering those weeds and they'll be looking to they'll be looking to set seed get in there with the desk and so that's your paraquat diquat mixers like people know them as spray seed or um, revolver there's, there's a few brand names um, and you could add you could even add a group g herbicide in there so something such as hammer or nail which just helps with broadleaf uh, brought those, those broadleaf weeds and hit yeah hit them straight after vintage so you stop that, that seed set that's got to be your, that's got to be the start of your the start of your strategy mm -hmm. and then i guess go, going forward um, as the season breaks you're then going to have your winter annuals come up cape weed rye grass um, you know all the all the weeds um, that we get in our pastures down here, and that's when you could start. You know, prior to prior to you've you've you know, you've had some essence in your vine, and prior to bud burst, you go with your you go with your glyphosate, and you get control of those weeds when they're small. You don't need to use really high rates. It's just all about getting the weeds when they're when they're small, because that's when um, they're most vulnerable. Yeah, okay. Um, glyphosate resistant weeds, what what are some of the things we need to look at doing to combat those issues? So really the, the number one thing there is to be sure, I guess, that you've got glyphosate resistance and you, you know you can take if if you think you've got that issue in your vineyard now, you can you can take seed heads now, send them off and, and you know, have that confirmed and um, more than happy to help. Uh, Scott and myself more than happy to help with that and Brooke as well I know she's done that in the past um, and um, and then if you have got you know you've got that problem you just you need to rotate away so you need to have an understanding of uh, herbicides and the, and their mode of action so I'm sure people are aware every herbicide's given a mode of act classified into a mode of action so glyphosate is a is a group M so you would you would then just look for your options out outside of that. So if you're thinking about products in particular or, or actives in particular, you've got things like Amitrol, Amitrol, Amitrol plus Paraquat. You've got glufosinate, so that's Basta. Then we'll have Basta and, and Bifo. So they're the they're the actives you want to you want to be moving to. And you want to you want to have a group G as well in, in with those. Not that that'll give you much control of the dry grass, but having more than one mode of action in your tank mix is gonna help with um, those resistant weeds and also stop resistance developing. Um, and the other point to make is, is use a quality formulation, but particularly with your glyphosate. Um, it does make a difference and it's been shown to make a difference through a lot of independent independent research um, ac across Australia. Um, so that's just using, you know, a well-known brand, Crucial, Roundup, you know, they're out there, people, people know them. They've got a surfactant package. They've got more than one acid as part of the formulation and that all helps to control um, the resistant biotypes. The importance of water rates and getting the volume right. Yeah, really, really important. Um, you know, it's all about, it's, it's just like if you're spraying your vine um, and, you know, you, you've got to get coverage. So in, in terms of weeds, you've really got to weigh up, I guess, the size of the, size of the weed um, and what you, the species of the weed, what, you, what you're trying to do. But I, the minimum that I would be using would be 100 litres. Uh, so more is better than less. Sort of more is better, definitely. Yeah, 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 okay. But if you're going to use sheep in your vineyard, so when you've pulled them out, yeah, would that be just use a glyphosate, and then that should keep you going for the rest of that season? So you pull your sheep, come out in September, do a spray yeah. glyphosate, and that should keep you going through for the season. Pretty much, but you just want to be thinking or looking at what the what the sheep are doing. I mean, if sheep are eating off the top of a weed, that weed will be growing underneath. Um, underneath the soil and so you you know you have a physiologically well developed weed with a big strong root system with only a small target on top so small target for your herbicide i mean so it's just yep. about thinking about you know that that timing um maybe you want to let the sheep knock down the bulk that's there um yeah you know, that's carried you know that may have carried over um through autumn 
and so you so you can target the, the, the weeds that are germinating, um, you know, at the break of the season. Yep. Okay. Good. Um, so under vine strategies leading after harvest, again, are you better to not do anything after harvest or does that depend on the weed burden in the vineyard? It depends on the, on the weed burden and what you've, what you've got there. Um, what I was saying before, I guess if you've got weeds that are there that are gonna set seed, 100% yep. I'd be in there doing something and, and then mm -hmm. stopping, stopping that. And I would, use, I would use the desiccant options to do that. Yep. And, and then just, again, a bit like the snails, comes back to monitoring. You know, if we get rainfall and you get a germination and you've got an opportunity to do a weed control with a, you know, with a herbicide such as glyphosate or amitrol, then mm -hmm. there's, there's an option to you know, reduce, the, reduce the burden. Yep. Oh, good. Cultivation, do you think that plays a part? Like, we've got a lot of organic guys down here and their sort of options are cultivate, or mow. Um, the cultivating can play a part in having some better control than like mowing and letting your grasses run a bit rampant. Yeah, de definitely. I, I think um, cultivation, slashing, like you said about sheep as well before, they're, they're, all, they're all strategies or tools that you can use as part of a strategy in, in, terms, of your, in terms of your weed control. I guess it's just understanding what that cultivation is doing is it, is it going to give me a kill is it going to stimulate further germination um, of weeds what's it doing to my organic matter or the mix of weeds i've got un under the vine um, it's just thinking about exactly what's that doing and then you know tailoring the timing of that cultivation uh, to, to, to suit yeah okay cool good um i can't think i've got anything else so just take homes for that again is like it's timing and then correct rate of water and correct chemical selection and stuff. So yeah. any questions like that, they can sort of call you or me and we can sort of talk them through what needs to be done. Yeah, and just just having an overall strategy for the for the season. Um, yeah. rather rather than thinking one one spray or one cultivation is you know is gonna is gonna do the job for me. That's yeah. That, that's what I'd be thinking. You know, something so, early, early, early programs give us the most flexibility. Mm -hmm. so, so be planned early. Something straight after vintage, then something at the break of the season, and then, you know, if you're monitoring then, and if you look like you've still got issues, you know, something in the in the early in the early spring, and there's and there's products to target the specific species that you've got there in and around those timings, but but certainly um, coverage. And the water volume is 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 paramount. Pre-emergence can they play a role in sort of in the vineyard? Yeah. So there's, I mean, as a company, we don't have anything um, specific. I, I guess we've got pendimethalin, which people will know is, is an older is an older herbicide that was used as a residual pre-emergent. Uh, but there's a product called Chateau, which is flumioxazin, um, which yeah, I've I've not seen much work with myself, but I know Scott has seen a bit with it, and you know you can get a th I think there's sort of a two to three month residual uh, with with something um, like flumioxazin sh Chateau. So you know that, again, that's about getting that particular product onto the soil. So good weed control early, so you so you've got the bare soil, and then you go on with your sh Chateau, and it's almost like a film um, that stops the weed germination for I mean the label claims up to a couple of months so for sure that, for sure that's a tool that could be um, that could be used if that's the sort of weed control that you or undermine I guess environment that you that you're looking yeah. for. What about is that safe to use with young vines? Uh, it is safe but you've got to be uh, again you can't be a, I think the vines have got to be three years uh, oh, so for, for the new plantings, you couldn't use yeah. that sort of thing. Not, not, not straight away, unless you, unless you're able to keep those herbicides off the vines. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. I'll just ask if there's any questions from the audience, and then I'll probably look at wrapping up. No. Okay. So thank you very much, everyone, for your time. So thank you, Slevana, Richard.
Brooke, Bernie and Scott, thank you very much for your time. And hopefully we all got something from this little session and we can sort of brush up a little bit better and get better at it. So um, yeah, thank you all. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Cheers.